I told you Vladimir would be next. Out of all the regions on Runeterra, lately Noxus has been getting a lot of love. We got the entire new Raven storyline, that was reflected in the newest Legends of Runeterra expansion. We got a new color story explaining Elise's position in the politics. We got Samira, followed by Rel, who both pushed the lore of Noxus even further. And of course, all those storylines are tied back to the Black Rose, a dark cabal organization hidden deep underneath the Immortal Bastion. But out of all the Black Rose members, one always stood out. Not only does Vladimir probably have the most lore out of all of them, but his lore is incredibly unique too. And because we are about to dive into the newest addition to his awesome story, we should quickly recap what happened to him so far. Vladimir was born as the prince of a forgotten kingdom which was being threatened by the Darkin during the Great Darkin War, which was about 550 years before the foundation of the Noxian Empire. Or, if you want, about 1500 years before the present days. With his father's crown at stake, and many more heirs ahead of him in the line of succession, Prince Vladimir was traded to the Darkin as a hostage. Now, since the Darkin were masters of blood magic, which allowed them to reshape their bodies, and which essentially made them immortal, to them, mortals were either slaves or playthings. But Vladimir believed that he was better than other mortals, and he believed he was worthy of the Darkin's power. And so, to entertain themselves, they allowed Vladimir to wield blood magic too. At first, Vladimir's devotion earned him a place in his patron's warhost. There he was able to practice hemomancy and carry out the Darkin's will on lesser beings. But over time, the godly tyrants watched with amusement, as Vladimir came to govern his subjects with as little mercy as the Darkin themselves. That's really how Vladimir came to be a hemomancer. He was given this power by the Darkin themselves, who were just bored. But Vladimir's story wasn't over just yet. The exact details of how the Darkin Wars ended are unknown. Of course, we know about what happened because of the story called Twilight of the Gods, where Zoe's godly ancestor turned a bit too dark. But canonically, the only known record of what happened was hidden in Mordekaiser's Immortal Bastion. And according to those records, Vladimir's Darkin Master wasn't imprisoned like all the other fallen god warriors. Instead, he died at the hands of his warhost. But even that isn't exactly correct. In reality, it was Vladimir himself who struck the killing blow, after which he drained the Darkin's body to renew his flesh and prolong his lifespan. And throughout the hundreds of years, he went through similar rituals countless times to stay alive. During Mordekaiser's reign, Vladimir lived on the cliffs of eastern Valoran, where he demanded blood sacrifices, and where he was worshipped as a god by the local barbarian tribes. That was until Leblanc approached him. After witnessing each other's dark magic, the two sorcerers realized they met an equal opponent. And so, that's how the pact between Vladimir and Leblanc started which kickstarted the Black Rose organization. Over time, other powerful nobles or masters of magic joined them, and soon the Cabal grew into a hidden power that controlled the throne of Noxus. And here's the unique thing about Vladimir. Even though he is a member of the Black Rose, as it is hinted by the fact that he has his own cult of followers, who worship him as well as blood magic itself, he rarely schemes from the shadows. In the past, Vladimir always revealed himself to the Noxian noble courts during the most interesting times, only to disappear decades later, staying hidden until he is entirely forgotten. And then, with the next opportunity, he would reappear during another interesting point in history. In fact, legends say that Vladimir was part of every major turning point in Runeterra's history. And the last time Vladimir went into hiding was before Swain came back from Ionia and started killing all the members of the Black Rose. However, in the story Art is Life, it was revealed that right before these big historical events happen, and before Vladimir reveals himself, he always finds an artist to paint him a portrait. And recently he got one from an artist called Mora, which means that Vladimir is about to join the grand political games of Noxus at any moment. And that's how we get to the newest story, which not only gives us an update on what is happening with Vladimir, but which also hints as to why he is waiting until he is forgotten.
So without further ado, here's the story called Alone. The story begins with our main character, Livia. It was her first night in the orphanage. Life had taken trust from her like everything else. But despite that, the safety of this place made her habits of survival go away. She had nearly finally fallen asleep when the door opened. Sin, the headmistress, came in to wake her up and ask her to come with her. Livia didn't want to return to the streets, so she obeyed and stood up. In the hall outside her room, Livia joined the other children who were already waiting there. All of them ranged from being 8 to 10 years old and all of them were collected from the streets of Noxus that day. There was a pair of brothers, three skinny boys who clutched each other's hands in unity, and Livia. Sin then apologized to everyone, and she told the kids that she knew the hour was late. But there were many demands upon the time of their patron, and still he wished to welcome the newly arrived, which was an honor. Livia noticed there was something odd about the way the headmistress explained what was happening. But before she had the chance to react, as if he appeared out of thin air, the patron stood before them. Tall, slender and clad in wealth Livia had never known. Sin took a step back, away from the kids, while the patron slowly walked from an orphan to orphan. He passed the brothers without a thought. Livia felt her pulse quicken as he paused, his pale eyes falling upon her, and she felt it slow again as he continued on. The trio of skinny boys bunched together, each defending the others, and the man barely spared them a glance. Her, the patron said to Sin, his voice low, silken. The scene then cuts to Sin holding Livia by her shoulder as they walk to another room. It was empty but for a single chair. Sin assured Livia that no harm would come to her, and again she repeated that this was an honor. Then she left the room and closed the door behind her. Livia walked to the chair and sat down. She watched the door intently since that was the only entry into the room, only to notice, a moment later, the shadow stretching out from behind her. It was the patron, and by no surprise to us, Vladimir. Livia showed up from the chair, and Vladimir noticed she was trying her best to contain her fear, despite what Sin told her. And so, with a cultured accent, he asked her if she really thinks he was here to hurt her. Livia shook her head, but it was far from convincing. Vladimir softly laughed, and he started circling around in front of her. He realized that life had probably done enough to her, and so he had no interest in making her life even worse. Instead, he came here to hear about her life, and what exactly brought her here. Then he kindly gestured to the chair, and slowly Livia sat down again. She then explained that she was from Drekan. Her father was taken by war, so they came to the city. Her mother went out to find work, but after four days they stopped waiting for her to come back. It was just her and her sister Vyra, and Livia made sure to keep Vyra safe. Livia tried to keep her voice strong, to show no weakness, but then it broke. She explained that later Vyra became sick, she couldn't protect her, and eventually Livia was alone. Livia's chest swelled with a tide of pain, of loss. Livia recoiled as Vladimir reached toward her to comfort her. Then, with a hypnotic voice, he told her to close her eyes, to focus upon that feeling, the pain. It has mounted for her in this unforgiving world, nowhere to go but bottled up inside. He told her to feel it rise up, above her neck, slipping up over her nose and her ears. It threatened to swallow her, but just at the precipice, it yielded. He told her to face it and feel it break against her. That was strength. Turn her mind upon it and allow it to drain from her. Livia let the pain flow out of her in sobs, feeling the cold glass against her cheeks softly touching beneath her eye. A torrent of despair, taking her breath. Then it was gone. Livia opened her eyes and Vladimir thanked her for sharing. Livia noticed that Vladimir was holding vials in his hands. She did not question these, but she still dared to ask Vladimir if he was alone too. Vladimir replied that he had seen much of this world over many years. And yes, almost all of it alone. Livia then asked if it will get better. Vladimir kindly smiled at her, with his eyes glimmering for a moment in a gentle show of sadness. He answered, 
For you, no. The scene then cuts to Sin and Vladimir talking in the hall. Sin asks him if the girl was unharmed. Vladimir raised an eyebrow and he asked Sin if she was harmed all those years ago when she was in that room and then tilted his head and presented a thin ampule in his long fingers. Sin's eyes locked on the slender tube of glass, its frosted length dulling the contents to a soft ruby. Sin snatched the ampule, her eyes darting as she poured it into the sleeve of her robe. Then Vladimir chuckled, said his farewell, turned and left. That night the moon was full and it bathed the streets of Noxus in radiant silver. Vladimir stopped at the fountain in the orphanage's empty courtyard, dipping finger into the still water. Crimson bloomed from his touch, rushing across the shallow pool, until it was like a massive glass of red wine. Stepping briskly up the lip of the fountain, Vladimir dropped into it without a sound or splash. In the last part of the story, Vladimir rose from another pool, somewhere within the dark halls of his manor emerging dry as if he had never touched the liquid. There he walked past all the artwork he collected over a thousand lifetimes, barely disturbing the settled dust as he ascended a staircase. For a moment he thought about Livia. To her, that night had to be a strange experience. But Vladimir knew it would not define her life. She would live and then die. And just like the others, her name, her face and their interactions would slip away from him, as they always did. People, the creatures surrounded Vladimir, yet they stood on the opposite side of an impossible gulf, tantalizing an impairment. A thin crooked smile came to him. He was melancholy tonight. He rolled the vial of tears in his fingers. The studio beckoned. Despite all the mortals he had forgotten, there were a few Vladimir refused to forget. And so he had to do what his mind could not. He had to somehow immortalize them. For his latest memory, which was from less than a millennium ago, he chose to get a painting. It was nearly finished. Many would mistake it for a masterwork. Obviously Vladimir had the years to hone a craft. All the details were there. The gentle tumble of auburn hair, the tanned skin, features that alone were commonplace, but combined affected a demanding regal aura. The expression, unthinkable loss. It was all there, safe for the whiteness of his eyes. Vladimir opened the vial, tipping it into a pot. The innocent tears mingled with the paint, and with the touch of his brush, it came alive when laid upon the canvas. Nothing else in all his travels could match the splendor it wrought. What was his name? He found he could not remember. The absent stabbed at him, a name gone, but at least the face preserved. The whites of his eyes would keep his memory here. Like a lonesome soul, he sought me out from beyond. Vladimir mused with a smile. More melancholy, but fitting, perhaps. After all, there was nothing in the world as beautiful as sadness. Okay, I am not sure if everyone understood what happened there at the end, so let me quickly explain what I believe is the case. The story revealed that despite Vladimir being immortal, his mind is not. And the longer he lives, the easier it is for him to forget things. Now here's the thing. We know that every time something big is about to happen in the world, Vladimir gets a painting of himself to immortalize an important moment in Runterva's history. In his last color story, he even found a painter who recently painted him a portrait. And in that story, we got a glimpse at a couple of his other portraits from the past. And in every single one of those paintings, Vladimir looked slightly different, because throughout the history, he changed with the world depending on what was happening at the time. That's why, at the end of this story, when he was painting a person with brown hair and pale eyes, using the tears of a kid, he was actually finishing a portrait of himself. And the reason why he didn't know the name of the man in the painting is because his memory isn't so good anymore, and he simply forgot it was him. This also begs the question, whenever Vladimir goes to hiding, does he wait until the world forgets about him, or does he wait until he himself forgets about what happened? I also want to mention how much I love the bait and switch in this story. We knew Vladimir extracted tears from Livia, so I was wondering why was the vial red when he handed it to Sin. 
Well, it turns out it was tears. But the vial he gave to Sin was blood. Which revealed that Sin is likely one of Vladimir's hemomancers. And that she is likely addicted to that sweet, sweet blood. I don't think it was Livia's blood either. I think Vladimir just has some of these on him to sate the thirst of his followers. So overall, it was a really interesting story. It didn't push the world forward, but it revealed who Vladimir really is. A goth villain extracting tears from orphans, who is also senile. 